You know, last week we had an opportunity to uh, take another look at Jesus in this final week of his life. In that text, we were introduced to Jesus in, uh, in a way that perhaps we've never really seen him before. Um, he had taken the spotlight and put it directly on the acts of the Pharisees and teachers of the law. And using them as bad examples began to kind of teach us a little bit more about what it means to be a follower of Christ. What, what does that really mean to follow after Jesus? Because everything that he looked at when he saw what was happening with the religious leaders of his day was something that he said, you know, um, his disciples, he was warning them against following in their steps. He said, I don't want you to, to do what they do. He says, because they don't practice what they preach. Everything they do is to be seen of men. And so he begins to pull the, the curtain back on their behavior and we're left with this decision that Jesus gave us early on in his ministry and that was simple. That we have to learn to hear his word, put that into practice and follow after him. The way Jesus said it was deny yourself, take up your cross, follow after me. And that's where we left it last week with Jesus in a very pointed and direct manner, speaking plainly about what is required if we're gonna follow after him. Well, today, Jesus is going to continue a conversation, only in this conversation, he's going to talk to his disciples about what is yet about to unfold. They really don't um, have much um, insight into what's going to happen. They, um, they aren't as familiar with what we know now as uh, written in the scriptures, that it gives us some um, insight in terms of this work that Jesus is about to accomplish on the cross and through his resurrection. All this, you remember, is still new to them. They're trying to pin, put all these pieces together. So I wanna invite you to look at Matthew chapter 24, because Jesus here is going to lead his disciples into um, what is in store for them. So I'm gonna read here from uh, Matthew chapter 24, just as an introduction before we get into uh, the message today. It says, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. This was a structure that was built by Herod the Great and um, was started you know, um, uh, way before the birth of Jesus and it had come to completion. It was really an architectural wonder. And uh, so the disciples, they called Jesus's attention to all of the temple and all of the buildings that surrounded it. And Jesus stopped and said to them, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. Now, as Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples come to him privately and they ask him, tell us, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Well, Jesus answered, watch out that no one deceives you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Christ and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Why don't we pause for a, just a word of prayer. Father, this is a, um, 
a moment in your ministry where the words that you are sharing with his disciples are profoundly troubling and rather dense. We're trying to get our heads around this good news of great joy that you have come to bring, and yet in these last days, Lord, it just seems that you are uncovering so much of the darkness that's around us. And, um, and in doing so, Lord, trying to point us in a direction where we can um, begin to settle in a little bit more on what this hope is all about, what it is that you want from us and for us. I pray that our hearts and minds would be open, that you would, by your spirit, really lead us and direct us so that we might come to a a fuller understanding of what you are trying to communicate. And as always, we'll be careful to give you all the praise in Christ's name. Amen. There was a a serviceman that was a pilot in the Air Force. His name was Robbie Robbins. He had flown over 300 missions in the Iraq war. When the war came to an end, he was surprised, but he had gotten orders that he was to gather all of his, uh, you know, troop, you know, uh, companions together and they would fly home. They didn't even to be told twice. They got on board that plane, they got all their stuff squared away, and the next thing you know, they're flying across the ocean and landing in Massachusetts. No sooner did they land in the middle of the night that they grab a car and they they lived in uh, western Pennsylvania, so they, they drove all through the night just to get home because he wanted to surprise his family. He gets to his house somewhere just about the time that the sun is beginning to come up. When he pulls in front of his home, there is this banner all across the whole front of their two-car garage. And it says, welcome home, dad. And he's like flabbergasted. Like, how did they know? He walks in and the kids are just waking up and they're like screaming and yelling, you know, dad's home, so good to see you. His wife is coming down the stairs, she's all dressed and her hair's done. (laughs) He's like, how did you guys know that I was coming home today? He said, we didn't even know we were gonna get home until just yesterday. And she says, well, we didn't. We just knew that the war was over and that you were gonna be home sometime soon, so we just determined to be ready. I I read that story and I thought, isn't that just like the attitude that Christians ought to have. As you read this word, we are given promises, aren't we? We, we, are, we are told what, what is about to happen, what is, what, is, what is about to unfold, and we're not sure exactly how that all fits on a calendar, but it, it arises within us a sense of hope and expectation And even the apostles will write and they'll say that our hope will never disappoint us because the love of Christ has been poured out out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that he has given to us. So this internal, you know, um, attestation of the Spirit with our spirit reminds us again of this hope. And so we're to live our lives every day ready for what God is, what what he could do on any given day. But see, we have that hope down because of what we read in these scriptures. But the disciples in the day of Jesus, they don't really have that kind of insight. They are beginning to think of Jesus as this Messiah. They expect that he is going to somehow or another rally the troops and bring about some emancipation for all of Israel so that they don't suffer any longer under the dominion of Rome. They're looking for an immediate solution. They think this Jesus, who is the Messiah, the promised one of God, when he comes, he's gonna make everything right. 
So they're not really expecting the answer that Jesus gives them. And what Jesus says to them, I think is instructive for all of us to really try to get our heads around. Because the truth of the matter is these disciples are clueless about what Jesus, what I just read to you is really all about. They are unprepared for the answer. And that question is what does the future hold for Jesus' followers. So let's go back now and look at a couple of these passages. If you look in Matthew 24, one to two, you find that Jesus is saying to his disciples, listen, as grand as all of these buildings are, I'm telling you that not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. You wanna know what the future holds for his followers? What the future is gonna hold is the destruction of the temple. The temple is a centerpiece of Jewish life. It was a part of their everyday experience. Their their lives revolved around the calendar of, of feast days and services, Sabbaths, that define them as the people of God. And now you're gonna tell me that that is going to be gone? Overnight, it's going to be destroyed? What is that gonna say about the rhythm of life? But Jesus is saying to them that what they see with their eyes right now is something that is transient. It's not gonna last. And not only is it not gonna last, But because it's transient, now it puts the disciples back on their heels a little bit, and they, it begins to evoke some deeper questions for them. So look at verse uh, three and five. It says here, it says, "What, what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? When will all of this happen? And so when you read through this text, it, it, it makes sense, right? They, they, they're being told something catastrophic is, is about to take place and they wanna know when. And they wanna know what does that really mean? Well, Jesus begins to address the what. And the first thing that he tells them here is that they better not jump to any conclusions. When you think about the end times, even now, as we are looking back on this work of Jesus done so many centuries ago, what does that evoke in your head about what is coming? Do you think about that? Because he's telling them here, look, don't jump to any conclusions. One way to, to, um, to kind of summarize this passage here, look what he says, he says, watch out that no one deceives you. And then he goes on to to discuss how many ways this deception could really come. And, um, And so you begin to read between the lines here and saying, listen, you wanna know what's going to happen, but let me first tell you that you better just hit the pause button and not jump to some conclusions because life is going to be filled with the reality of a fallen world. You're thinking that maybe the the son of man is gonna come and make everything right. And that is true, but not yet. Because look look what he says, he says, many will come in my name claiming that I am the Christ and they're gonna deceive many. So there is a sense of apostasy that is going to take place in this land. Not only that, it says, you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed for such things must happen. So there is this anarchy that's gonna take place. The world events, wars and rumors of wars. There's this worldwide unrest. How many times have you heard people in the days in which we're living now, they look out at the world and the distress in which they find it, and they're already jumping to conclusions. Oh, Jesus is coming back. 
Well, I know he's coming back, but they want to know when. They want to know what has to happen first. What are the signs? As if it was going to be that clear. So not only is there apostasy and anarchy, but there's catastrophic disasters that are going to take place. It says there are going to be famines and earthquakes in all various places. But notice what he says here. He says all these are the beginning of what? Of birth pains. The birth pains, they are a signal that something is about to be born, right? But those birth pains, they're they're not coming with such frequency and regularity that it's indication that the birth is imminent. So he's telling them, he says, when you look out at the world, don't be deceived. Don't jump to the wrong conclusions here because the time is going to be filled with all kinds of deception. Look at verses 9 through 14. It goes from a time that's filled with deception to a time that's going to be followed by some personal trials. Verse 9, it says, you'll be handed over to be persecuted, put to death. You'll be hated by all the nations because of me. So there is a sense of persecution, but then there's this faithlessness that's going to be found. And again, the rising of false prophets, not people who are coming and saying, I am the Christ. They're just beginning to tell people, you know, a a different gospel. They're beginning to um, shed uh, or, or spread news that is going to be contrary to this good news that Jesus has been sharing. So look at verses 10 and 11. It says, at the time, many will turn from the faith. And that's going to show that they never really were of you. Can you remember when Jesus gave the story of the sower and the seed? And he said that seed falls on rocky soil and it springs up. But because it has no roots, when the sun comes out, it burns the plant because it it can't sustain itself. And then Jesus turns to his disciples and says, the sun is a metaphor for persecution and trouble. And if you don't have deep roots, when things go sideways, the tendency is people are just going to give it up. And not only that, in, in in the face of all these false prophets who are trying to dream their own dream, It becomes a place of confusion. And then listen to the apathy that sets in. It says in the text here, it says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Can we not relate? A constant bombardment, so much vitriol, disagreement, There's so much contention that's in the world. After a while, it just wears you down, doesn't it? You you just want you just want to like pretend like you know none of this stuff is happening. I'm just going to self-medicate. I don't want to have to deal with all this anxiety around me all the time. Why can't we just love one another? Well, because sin is in the world. Evil is in the world, and it required a savior. That's why Jesus came. He says, I have come to do what? To forgive men of their sin. I have come to give my life a ransom for many. I have come so that by my stripes you would be healed. This is as real as it's going to get. But do you notice something else here? Because there is, it's, it's not just about all of the brokenness that's around us. Intermingled with all of this, there is also this sense of advancement. Here, look at, look at verse 13. It says that the love of many will grow cold, but, and that's a big but, it says he who stands firm to the end will be saved. So if we persevere, it says that will be rewarded. 
Which seems to also imply then that as a result of standing firm in the midst of all of this aggression and all this hostility and all of this anxiety, God says, I will keep you and I will save you. And not only that, here is, here is another, here's another uh, a point. It says this gospel of the kingdom, right? So gospel literally means good news. So this good news of the kingdom of heaven, right, will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and what? Then the end will come. Think about this. The end is going to come as a result of what? The end is gonna come as a result of this good news of the kingdom of heaven being cast to all the nations. Can I just give you a little heads up of where all this is going? Because at the end of Matthew 28, we're about to receive a great commission to go into all the nations and make disciples. If we wanna see the end come, then one of the surest ways to hasten that coming is to make sure that we're about the Father's business. If there's, any, if there's any reason for us to find hope in the midst of all of this brokenness, is God saying the only way out of this mess is by the proclamation of a gospel that will one day result in the redemption of this world. So instead of keeping our voices quiet, instead of growing cold, instead of just you know um, getting along to, to get along, he's saying, no, 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 I, I need you to be the light that shines in the midst of this darkness. I, I need you to maintain your saltiness in a world that is filled with so much decay. See, it's crucial that these disciples understand that the world that they are inheriting is not gonna get better overnight. In fact, he's telling them the temple is going to be destroyed. This whole center that brought all of the nation of Israel together is going away. And what's gonna take its place? What takes its place is the creation of the body of Christ. What's taken its place is now the hope in sins forgiven because of a crucifixion and a hope that is rendered certain because Jesus rises from the dead. So the symbols of crucifixion and resurrection is at the foundational level of what it means to be Christian. I can let go of guilt, I can let go of anxiety, I can let go of this despair, why? Because he is for me, not against me. Shame, guilt, regret, all of those things wrapped up now are put to death in the death of Jesus. And now I'm given new hope, proven by a resurrection from the dead. So it is crucial to understand that what Jesus is saying to his, these disciples is that there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of signs that you're gonna be confronted with, but I don't want you to draw the wrong conclusions. Because the signs before you, they're deceptive. The evil one would love to get your head into another space and you personally are gonna feel the rejection because my kingdom, Jesus is saying, is not of this world. There is this spiritual warfare that's taking place between the authorities of this world and the authority of Jesus. And he will reign supreme. It says that all authorities, powers, dominions are gonna be placed under his feet. But when? 
That's a big question, isn't it? Well, look what he says here in verses 15 through 28. I'd, I'd just like to read this passage for you now. He says, so when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation. This is a, a phrase that comes out of the book of Daniel. It's a prophetic word that was used to show a, um, a, a, a complete abomination that was taking place. He says, when you see this happening, he says, which was spoken through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. They're not getting around too easy, are they? And in a moment, like if you've ever lived down south or been in a, in a, in a place where uh, tornadoes touch down, the sounds go off, you hear the rumbling, like it says, like a freight train coming. People postpone the warnings because they think, well, just because a tornado comes doesn't mean it's gonna hit my house. But if it starts heading in your direction, sometimes it's too late and all you can do is just hunker down. Jesus is saying something is about to be unleashed and it's gonna be a dreadful day. He goes on here in this, in this passage, right? And he says, he says, pray that your flight will not be taking place in winter or on the Sabbath. Why would they say the Sabbath? Everything's closed on the Sabbath. Nothing's open. Remember, this is part of this whole Jewish economy. The Sabbath was a day of rest. You did no work. Shops weren't open, supplies weren't available. And it was made even worse by all the regulations that the Pharisees put in place. You couldn't even light a fire because that was considered work. So you see, this is, this is a scene of total destruction. He says, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is out in the desert, don't go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible to the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass there, the vultures will gather. It is a scene of absolute chaos and destruction. Evil is about to be unleashed. And that's what is being portrayed here. There is this grievous sacrilege that is taking place. That temple is coming down. People are gonna lose their lives. The war of Masada that historians, all you have to do is Google the war of Masada, AD 70, and you'll see that all of these things come true. Tens of thousands of people massacred because of a revolt and the suppression by the Romans that they, 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 they literally seize the city and starve it out. So there's not only great suffering, but there's great distress. Look at verse in 21 to 25, isn't that what he says? It's unequaled from the beginning of the world until now. Look at verse 24, he says, for false prophets and 
false, false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs, miracles to deceive even the elect if that were possible. See, there is this hardship ravages of war that are felt in various places. Jerusalem is about to experience that full force. Do you think the disciples had any clue when they were sitting with Jesus in that Mount of Olives looking down over the temple and all of its buildings, admiring the magnificence of the structure it seemed immovable. And yet with deep sorrow, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, that one stone is gonna stay on another. It's all coming down. He hinted at that at the end of chapter 23, remember when he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I, would, how I wish to gather you as, a, as, a, as, you know, as, as children, as a, as a hen gathers its chicks, but you were unwilling to come to me. And now he says, your house is going to lie desolate. I, I would imagine if we were part of that group of those disciples, we'd hear those words and we'd look at each other like, well, what is he saying? Because it's not like you have a magic ball that you can just look through and everything becomes clear to you. We only know it now because we have a rear view mirror that we could look into and see what, what has transpired. Historians tell us how this played itself out. But for those young disciples sitting around with Jesus, they just want to know when is the kingdom coming? What are the signs of this kingdom? You think they were prepared when Jesus says, okay, you want to know what these signs are? Number one, the temple is going to be destroyed. Number two, get used to living in a world that's going to consistently show its dark side. Evil is about to be unleashed. There's going to be confusion. But God knows how to keep his elect, doesn't he? Isn't that like when you read here in verse 24? It says it's strong enough to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. Look at verses 26 on. He says here, so if anyone tells you, there he is out in the desert, don't go. Why? Because he says, as the lightning you know, flashes, it's so obvious that people on the east and the west, they're going to see it. You are not going to miss the coming of the Son of Man. So people trying to tell you, oh, here he is or there he is, don't worry about that because it's going to be obvious. You're not going to miss it. But don't be deceived. But there is a promise in all of this. See, the question about what and when had everything to do with the future. And Jesus is telling them on this week where it will culminate in his crucifixion, he's telling you things are gonna get bad, but they're also gonna get good. Because while he is giving them a reality check here about the evil that is about to be unleashed, he's also telling them of a promise of deliverance. In verse 29, look what he says. He says, immediately after the distress of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Well, what is that all talking about? It's the vestiges of judgment that has fallen on the world. Don't you see it's not the same place anymore. There is a sense of utter destruction wherever you see. The sun's not shining. The moon is not reflecting. 
The stars are not in the sky. It's done. It's like you're standing there and the dust has settled and it's no longer the same. But then notice what he says here in verse 30. At that time, when judgment is complete, at that time, the sun, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. All the nations of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from the one end of the heavens to the other. Isn't it interesting that Jesus now is predicting his second coming, but with that second coming, it's such a mixed reception. Nations of the world mourn, why? Because they know the gig is up. Their reign is over. The evil that had infiltrated the world around us has now been judged. All things are about to be made new. But this second coming, that's coming after the first coming. This first coming of Jesus is followed by destruction of a temple of a world that is at war with itself, a persecution of righteousness in the midst of all of this evil. And all of that is continuing until the day that judgment is complete. And on that day, the Son of Man comes and his angels, it says, will gather the elect from all the four corners of the world. It's over. Revelation has much to say about this, but it talks about a day then when all things will be made new. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more sickness, no more tears. I don't know about you, but I can't wait. It's fine with me not to do another funeral. It's fine with me not having to sit across the table from someone who is just overcome. I can't wait until that heaviness is removed. See, the, as much as Jesus tells those disciples that they're going to live life in a fallen world for a period of time, he also gives them this promise of deliverance. And then he ends with the certainty of God's word. Listen to what he says here. He says, now... Learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you, you know that summer is near. And even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. You see that all these things here in verse 33, when you see all these things, that's what he's just been telling us. The deception, the personal trials, 
the, the evil that seems to be perpetrated in the world, but also the witness of those who are going out and spreading this gospel to a world because that gospel is gonna fall on some people's ears and they will be saved. But all of this, he says, is gonna to come to a head. And so in verse 34, he says, I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass until all these things have happened. So that means, and don't let this escape you right now what I'm gonna tell you. Jesus said all these things are gonna happen in that generation. So what's left? What else has to happen for Jesus to come back? See, everything has already been accomplished. There's nothing more to be accomplished. Everything that took place within that period of time following the crucifixion of Christ and his resurrection, it's that period of time now between that judgment and when Christ comes again. As a result of his death on a cross, all authority, all power, all dominions have been placed under his feet, but not yet. He won the victory by that cross and that resurrection, but God's patience now is giving us time to go out and share this gospel of good news because at the right time, he's gonna come back. Second Peter chapter three, verse eight says that, don't forget that with the Lord, a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years. But God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Because the, salva the patience of God is the salvation of men. So there's nothing else that has to happen for Jesus to come back other than he is giving us opportunity to share this good news with neighbor and friend and family, to not allow the hatred of this world to so place us in a position of apathy that we do nothing. Don't let the world just snuff out this life of love and faithfulness. Don't let the fruit of the spirit in your life come to naught. There's a thousand and one ways in which the world around us would just like to take the love of Jesus and silence it. But now is not that time. Everything has come to a head. It's just the patience of God now that is allowing people an opportunity to repent. And you and I play a role in that. What a privilege to be salt of the earth, light of the world. You can't let evil allow your love to grow cold. My friends, everything has been completed. Now we just wait for that day when we shall see him appear along with his angels to restore all things. And he tells you point blank, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. So what I'm sharing with you is truth. And so every day you and I wake up because it could be the day that Jesus is coming back. The stage has already been set. We're just waiting for that day. And we wait with great expectation because he made a promise. And that hope deposited inside this heart keeps us from despair. No, we run this race marked out.
We will run and not grow weary. We will walk and not faint. Because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Disciples, they had no idea when they asked the question about what the future held. But Jesus tells them the truth. The reality is that evil is going to be unleashed, but I bring deliverance. And I will bring you to myself. Just hang on. And do the work that I've sent you to do. These disciples, they're going to change the world. It will never be the same. I mean, the world in which we're living now may be changed because our lives have made a difference. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for strong words that are fit for the days in which we're living. So much of this world that seeks to just take the joy out of us. But just the contemplation, Lord, on these great and precious promises is enough to renew our spirit. To give us a picture of what lies ahead so that we run with great endurance this race of faith. I pray that everyone that hears these words would find themselves encouraged, holding on to this hand of the Savior until that day that we see you face to face. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.